All right, excited to see folks start to join here. We can start in just a minute or two once everybody has a chance to get connected. In the meantime, make sure your audio is working. If you do have any questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A panel. Uh, and we'll be sure to get to them. Um, but thank you for joining us today. Uh, and we'll get started in, in just a minute or two. Excellent. Is everybody ready to get started here? Yes. Wonderful. So welcome everybody uh, to this Congressional App Challenge event, our back to school webinar before we get to our contest deadline this year. Uh, today's session is titled Creating a Generative AI Chatbot App Using MIT App Inventor. And we are so excited to have the MI, some of the MIT App Inventor team here today uh, to talk to you guys a little bit about how you can go about doing this. This is going to be a really fun event. So uh, my name is Joe Alessi. I am the program director here at the Congressional App Challenge. And I'm so excited. We've had such strong interest in this year's Congressional App Challenge. And such great interest in today's event. So we're really looking forward to, uh, to this. Um, just some housekeeping before we get started. If you are a Congressional App Challenger, somebody who is in the process of applying to this year's Congressional App Challenge, we are exactly two weeks out from the deadline. And so hopefully you're putting the finishing touches on your app. Maybe you're here today to supplement something that you're working on. Just keep in mind, you've got two weeks to go before your submissions due. And so make sure to get those, those applications submitted prior to the November 1st deadline so that we can make sure that your member of Congress sees your app and you have an opportunity to be honored alongside hundreds of other students at the Capitol this spring as part of our Congressional App Challenge class of 2023. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn this presentation over to the folks that you're here to, to, to hear from and you're here to learn from. Um, and to do that, we've got uh, a number of... Uh, folks who are involved in the MIT App Inventor program, including Perna Ravi, who is a PhD student at MIT um, and works pretty closely with the MIT App Inventor team. She's going to lead you uh, along with her team through the rest of the session today, um, but I will be here to answer any questions in the Q&A panel. Um, if your teams have any questions or anything, just please let us know. Otherwise, Perna, please take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Um... So yeah, hello everyone. Uh, it's really nice to have you here today. Um, and as part of today's workshop, we're gonna have you first learn a little bit about what MIT App Inventor is, and also ultimately create a generative AI chatbot using the tool available there. So let's start off with some introductions. Um, so first of all, I'll introduce yeah. my- I, I can't see the slides moving. Oh. As soon as you change the slide. Um, is it moving? Oh, yes. No. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm Prerna. I'm a CS PhD student at MIT. Um, I was also an undergrad at Georgia Tech, where I majored in computer science and I had concentrations in UI UX design and artificial intelligence. Um, Currently, I'm doing a lot of research in AI literacy, so I'm trying to understand how we can better learn about AI tools and also educate others about it. So how do you understand how tools work in the back end? What do you need to know about AI? What the implications are of using AI tools on a daily basis and how we can go about using it responsibly and ethically as well. Uh, so my primary research is in educational technology. So I look to build tools that are inclusive in the classroom for a wide range of communities, um, including differently able groups, as well as socially marginalized communities in developing nations. Um, so in the past few years, both uh, during my undergrad and now during my PhD at MIT, I've worn many different hats. So I've played many different roles, one as a UX researcher, so a user experience researcher, but also as a curriculum designer, I've developed a lot of curriculum uh, within education for teachers, for students, for parents. Um, 
And I've also uh, in the past worked as a software developer through various internships in my undergrad, which I can talk about a little bit later. And I've also been a teacher in the past. So I have one tip for you guys, since a lot of you might be in high school thinking about applying to colleges and as you start thinking about the application process uh, and um, maybe it's super daunting, maybe you're thinking about what college entails. So the one tip I have um, is like, don't be afraid to try out new things. Like there are a lot of things um, like available out there, but there is no right or wrong answer. So you just have to sort of try it out and see if that's something you like. Now, the one good thing I can say about college for sure from my experience is that you always have the option of switching. So if you don't like some activity that you take up, no one's going to say that you have to continue going down that route and there is no other way out. So try to keep an open mind as in when you try out new topics that seem to be of interest and you take a stab at it, try to pursue it and see if that's something you potentially enjoy and if you have found your passion. And if that's not a field you ex expected to, that's also completely fine. The only thing I'll say is like, don't freeze. Like if something uh, happens or you're not interested in something, like just try to keep going and you'll eventually find an area that you're super passionate about within your undergrad, whether that's your major, whether it's a subfield within the major that you want to work on, like whether it's a particular club that you want to join, whether it's research you want to do, just try to keep an open mind and try to take advantage of as many opportunities as you can that are thrown at you in college like college is filled with resources filled with people around you who have a lot to offer so try to take advantage of that so for instance I found my passion after joining research in undergrad and it was not conventional for people to do research in their undergrad but I thought that that's something that I would want to try out so I just tried it out uh, by fluke and I realized that that's something that I really enjoy and I started doing research in the education field but as you can see, like I wouldn't have realized that until I had like pursued that research project. So just try to keep some like goal in mind and just keep going. Um, and I just picked it up because I thought it would be interesting after reading about it online. Um, cool. I'll pass it on to Gisela. Yeah. Hi everyone. My name is Gisela. I am a senior, so I'm in my last year studying computer science and Spanish. Um, within App Inventor specifically, I'm mostly focused on the data science team. Basically, how are we able to take in sensor data or sensor information and have App Inventor give us some sort of analytical insights into trends? Uh, I'm also part of the Incarcerated Veterans Program. We kind of call that the main state prison program where we help teach App Inventor curriculum to incarcerated veterans. And then the last part I'm part of is the prompt engineering team with Appley. Um, this is part of the generative AI part of um, App Inventor, and I'm specifically focusing on trying to improve the performance of our prompts. Uh, so aside, outside of school and research, I also do fun things like here at MIT. There's so many activities that are available. Uh, I'm specifically doing cheerleading. I'm co-captain and I'm part of the gymnastics team. Um, so that shows that like even though MIT is a really tough place, there's still plenty of avenues for you to explore your options, as Perna said, and to sort of find things that you love and enjoy doing outside of academics, right? Um, so my tip for you guys would be to kind of, um, going off of what Perna was saying, she talked about trying new things, right? But at the same time, you don't want to be trying everything because there's only so much time in a day and you want to focus your time on the things that you really care about. So that's why my tip for you guys is to pick just a few things that you have found that you really enjoy doing and to so show commitment and passion by sticking through it. So for me, that was Girl Scouts. I actually joined Girl Scouts when I was in fourth grade and I did it all the way up until I finished high school, which is pretty rare uh, for Girl Scouts. So that just uh, is another way that you guys can do things that that show your abilities outside of like um, AI computer science um, aspect. So I'll have more tips for you guys towards the end at the panel. Cool. Hola, hello everyone. My name is Isabella Sanchez. Uh, I'm an international student from Peru. I'm currently studying computer science and education at Wellesley College. And as part of Wellesley College, I can also take classes at MIT, do research at MIT, work, and just have fun around. So uh, I want to talk uh, a little bit about that experience too. Uh, currently, I'm working on the Inventor Lab, 
well, I'm focusing on the education curriculum, but also on the Mainstead Prison Project and Apply from Engineering too. So it's like, oh, with Gisela and David, we see each other a lot. <laughs> and then fun things that I do in college, uh, I always love music. So when I arrived here to the States, I was like, I want to continue pursuing music, whether it's like taking some classes or just joining a cappella group. So I am part of MIT Wellesley Tunes that it's a cool acapella that uh, is cross campus between MIT and Wellesley. And also I am a DJ, a, a DJ at the college radio here. So I have my, my radio show every Saturday, 8 p.m. <laughs> and it's just a fun thing to do, you know, because I think college is here. Uh, when you arrive to college, you want to pursue a lot of a lot of things, but also you need to remember your past passions. Uh, for example, when I was in middle school, I loved writing, and then in high school, I loved technology. But when I arrived to college again, writing was something that I needed for every course, and I started writing again. I started continue with music, so that uh, that would be a, a little advice. Like if you have a past passion that you stop pursuing one time, why not again in college? Maybe that could lead to something even bigger. Uh, and my tip uh, in general in life and also in college applications will be that the most fun part of the learning process is when the mentee becomes a mentor. Um, I have a lot of friends that are applying to college now. And most of them told me, oh, no, I don't have extracurriculars. I don't have nothing to show. But actually, they have been doing like volunteer for years teaching. And whether it's programming, robotics, or just like, um literacy in my country so it's like actually you have done too many things you have been mentoring too many people you have been changing lives like while teaching so if you have a passion and you feel like you want you you are really so passionate about this why don't try to teach it I, I always think like that because also when you teach something uh you uh, actually understand better the topics you feel like more expert, more expert every time you teach it every uh, again and again. So I don't know. I always advise people like to take that little step that uh, makes them from being a mentor to uh, to be from being a mentee to a mentor. It's fun, and that will be my tip. Ooh, thank you, um, David. Hi everyone. I'm David. I'm a software developer at the MIT App Inventor team. I manage, fix bugs, maintain um, on the backend side of App Inventor. Um, a lot of the things that you will be doing today, I have contributed a few things in uh, the chatbot uh, components. Um, on the second point, I added that one of my hobbies is watching movies. And I added this because when I was your ages during middle school, high school, my actual dream was to become a movie director. I have passion in watching movie. I analyze movies. But, you know, now, now I'm working as a software developer. And I wanted to kind of make a point that life is like a box of chocolate. You never know what you get. And I kind of want to uh, connect with what um, Prenna said here is that um, I, I know some of you may be confused what, what a career I should pursue, but I would say do not be too stressed about it. Um, just enjoy your everyday life and things come together and you will eventually find what you like if you continuously work hard. So that's when I, one thing I want to say. And a tip I wanted to say today is many things in your life can be improved by technology. And that is also what uh, the, the ethos of App Inventor is. Today, all of you are going to learn a wonderful technology that has many, many potential to improve many things in your life. So I hope everybody enjoys. Cool. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Um, and uh, based on what we just mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A and we will try our best to either answer it in the chat itself or we'll come back to it at the very end. We're going to have a Q&A session at the end of this workshop where you can ask us any questions you want regarding MIT, regarding applying to colleges, regarding what it feels like being in the field of computer science um, or programming. So please feel free to ask anything you want in the chat and we'll try our best to answer it. Um, cool. 
So, uh, first of all, um, you guys might be wondering what MIT App Inventor is to begin with. So, App Inventor is this free open source like platform that's available for anyone to use, and it allows anyone, whether that's um, an adult, whether that's uh, you students, whether it's an educator, a hobbyist. Uh, it allows anyone to basically come in and create mobile applications. So the apps that you use on a daily basis, App Inventor is able to create some of those applications or replicate it. And it does that through a very simple drag and drop interface. So it involves programming, but it's a very simple form of programming that we will show you later on uh, today in the workshop. So it allows you to create apps very seamlessly in the process. So a little bit of history regarding how App Inventor came into place, like it was founded in 2007 by researchers at uh, MIT and Google. And the main vision was to enable anyone uh, on this planet to be able to create mobile apps for real effective change in their communities. It was to empower people around us. So um, a little bit about what App Inventor does beyond that. So through App Inventor, we not only want students to learn uh, about how to build apps, but also to practice other skills that are critical to succeeding in any field that they decide to pursue. So we promote design thinking, which uses a five-step process to critically analyze and build applications, right from coming up with a very vague idea to really formulating it further, prototyping it and testing it out. And through blog-based coding, which we will show you in this workshop, we also aim to advance computational thinking skills. And one of our final goals is to make this tool as inclusive and widely available as possible to everyone across the globe, including those communities uh, that are on the margins or those that have been historically underrepresented in technology. So this is an App Inventor generative AI workshop. So now the question is, what is generative AI? So generative AI is this buzzword that we are all hearing about today, um, like in today's world, especially in the last few months. Um, that basically refers to any model that's able to create brand new output from the data that's already available out there on the internet. So the internet has a large amount of data, whether that's text-based data, whether that's videos, whether that's... Um, um, images, etc. So the idea is that these algorithms, they're able to take those vast amounts of data and they're trained on those and they're able to produce brand new um, images or brand new photos that we have never seen anywhere before. So generative AI models, they are basically able to learn patterns from the existing data that we have provided them with. And they're able to look at that internal structure and generate new data that has very similar characteristics. So this is an interface that a lot of you might be might have seen. Uh, this is ChatGPT. This is a very common example of generative AI that a lot of us have interacted with and is super prevalent in today's world. So ChatGPT is this large language model chatbot, basically, that was developed by this company, OpenAI, and it enables all users to refine and steer a conversation depending on what format they want to follow, what style they want, what level of detail they want to engage with, uh, with a chatbot, etc. And this particular model, it can answer questions and it can assist you with several tasks such as like composing emails, composing essays, and even writing code. So this is an example of a generative AI powered application. Uh, it's called Kamify, and it was actually built with an app inventor itself. So uh, we're just trying to show you an example of what a generative AI powered app might look like. And this is something uh, similar to what we'll also be going over in our workshop today. Um, it's a mental health application, this particular app that I'm showing as an example. And here is a video that sort of goes over what this app did and how it was built and what the purpose is. So this is just to give you an example of what this might look like. Uh, so I'm going to play this. Um... Hi, I'm Jocelyn. I'm Jack. And today we will be explaining Comify and our inspiration behind this app was to advocate for mental health wellness through a journaling system. And what makes our app unique is its special AI emotion detection. So after we finish setting up this new user account, the first thing we'll be greeted with is the journaling page. And the different happy and sad emojis you see up there help the user to track their mood across past journal entries. And here are some different journaling scenarios and a user will have the ability to record some roses, thorns, and emotions throughout their day. They can also add a picture, a really nice picture, 
in my opinion, and they can add some activities they did during the day. And so after finishing up their journal entry and submitting, the app will take the journal entry and plug it into OpenAI software to detect how the day was, what emotions filled it, loneliness, happiness, stress, for example, and will recommend a personalized arrangement of features to help address any negative emotions present. If it's a happy day, it might just congratulate the user. If it was a stressful one, it could recommend some stress relieving resources. And we will be going over these resources next. All right, here are some um, modules and you can actually edit your profile. So your first module is a personal AI friend you can chat with. Our next module or resource is the memory lane where you can view memories you added or the app added from your happy journal entries. And researchers have found that looking and reminiscing over your past happy memories can help improve one's mood. All right, our next module is an activity planner. So based on the activity you have chosen, the app will design um, an activity plan based on your location. Next are multiple music therapies you can use to calm yourself, meditate, or to help you fall asleep. Our next module are stress relief techniques, including paper ripping and pillow punching. Finally, we have some help resources, including hotlines and what they're about. You can dial from the app directly if you need to. Thank you. Cool. Um, so yeah, this was a very quick example of what uh, an application might look like when it is built with an app inventor and which uses generative AI in the background. Um, so let's move on. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be building a chat GPT powered voice application in particular for college admissions guidance. So we thought this topic would be super relevant uh, to a lot of you because um, you're currently in the process of deciding what career you might want to pursue, whether you want to apply to a specific college or maybe what major you want to do and what colleges would be good for that particular major. So um, this app will sort of help you uh, potentially brainstorm some of those ideas. So as a first step, we would like all of you to, okay, as a first step, actually, make sure that you, you have a laptop that's connected to a very stable like Wi-Fi network. And also make sure that you have a phone next to you, a smartphone that's connected to the same Wi-Fi network. Like that's a disclaimer. We want to make sure that you have that. And as a first step, what we're going to have you do is you need to navigate to code.appinventor.mit.edu. Uh, David will put the link in the chat for you guys to pull the link from. Um, I'll give everyone like just a second to do so. Um, you need to go to this particular URL. This is the URL on which you're going to be like building the application today. So make sure that you have this pulled up in a new tab uh, so that you can walk through the entire tutorial with me. Uh, the next step would be to download this particular file. So this, uh, you can type this URL directly into your browser. It's just tinyurl.com slash chat GPT college app. If you can navigate to that and download the Google Drive link uh, from it, it'll be great. It should download a specific uh, file for you. Um, are there any questions? Like I'll wait here for just a second so that you do the first two steps. One, navigate to the website and two, download this particular file from this link. I'll give a minute just so that everyone has this set up and make sure you know where the file has been downloaded, like on your laptop, just check where the location is so that it's easy for you to pull from in a second. If you have any questions, please ask uh, in the Q and A, uh, someone will answer it, but um, Cool. Uh, I think I'll go ahead. Um, please feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions that come up. Um, cool. Now, the first thing you're going to do is when you navigate to code.appinventor.mit.edu, this is the screen that you will see. So what we would like for you to do is just for the purposes of this tutorial, you can continue without creating an account. Maybe later on, like after uh, this session, if you want to play around with this tool more, which I hope that you want to do, uh, then you can create an account so that you can save some of your work for later. But for this, let's just continue without using an account. So click on that particular button 
and then following that this is the screen that you should see ideally so there should be a code that shows up in the middle of the screen um as you can see over here and um maybe copy paste that code somewhere locally just so that you can maybe come back to this particular project if uh, like later on you want to reference it so that you don't lose your work because you're continuing without using an account just make sure you copy paste the code i'll give you one second to do that before i go ahead Cool. Uh, following that, you can hit continue. And then this is the next screen you'll see. Um, again, you can just hit continue on the screen. This is this is screen introducing you to uh, App Inventor. This is a video that you can probably go and watch later um, if needed. But yeah, for now, you can hit continue. And this is the next screen that you will see. So this is the screen on which you ideally, after logging into MIT App Inventor, you can start creating a project within which you'll start creating an app. So for the purposes of this tutorial, just because uh, we have very limited time, what we're going to have you do is we have provided a particular file uh, from where you're going to be pulling some of the scaffolded code and you'll be making some changes to it rather than building an entire application from scratch. So for now, you'll just hit close, but ideally you would want to create a blank project or like start with one of these tutorials to get familiar with the tool. But for today, just hit close. We'll show you how to go about it. So just hit close on the screen. Following that, uh, you're going to click on the project drop down at the top left hand corner. And uh, there is an option that says import project with that extension dot AIA from my computer. So you're going to click on that within the drop down. And this will uh, basically pull up. Um, this window on which you can choose a file from your computer. And this is where you're going to choose the file that we asked you to download, uh, the Chat GPT College app. It has the same extension .aia. So uh, select that particular file from your laptop and upload it. Um, and once you upload it, this is what you should see. I'll again give a, a second for you to locate the file. Cool. Uh, once you locate the file and upload it, you just have to hit OK. Um, and yeah, uh, once you have this set up, we are ready to proceed. And this is where the fun part starts. Um, so as a first step, just so that you know how app building works, like developing an application works, uh, there are typically two parts to it. The first step is designing what the application will look like. So what buttons you would want on the screen, what text you would want on the screen, um, like what are the user interface elements that you would want to see when the user pulls up your app on their phone. So that's the first step, designing what those elements will be and where they'll be placed on the screen. So uh, for today's application, we want the app to look like uh, the screen on the right. Um, and this is what I'm going to show you on the next screen. So once you um, upload your file, uh, this is what you should ideally see. Um, so this is the main MIT app inventor like user interface within which you're going to start developing your application. Um, so let me explain a little bit like what this entails because there are a lot of options here. So it might be a little uh, overwhelming, but don't get overwhelmed. We're going to walk you through every step on the screen. Um, so as a first step, uh, you should understand that, uh, the thing highlighted here, like this particular box, it has a bunch of components within it. So these components are basically your user interface elements. Um, so on this particular screen, we have a bunch of labels, a button, like a chart. So all these interface elements will show up in this particular box as you keep adding them. Um, the thing that you see on the extreme left, which is highlighted on this screen, um, are the inter uh, interface elements that you can add to it. So the one on the previous screen was basically what's already in your application. And the one over here is what you would ideally want to add more to your application if needed, like additional components. 
And uh, this thing on the extreme right are the properties for a specific uh, component that you have selected. So in this particular case, for example, as you can see, uh, screen one is highlighted here, right? So within properties, you can edit certain, um, like, I guess, features related to screen one, whether it's setting a background color to your screen, whether it's adjusting the height for a certain sort of width of your cell phone, or maybe adding a background image to it that you would want to be laid across your entire application, et cetera. So properties allows you to change the color, the text, anything related to the appearance of a specific component on your screen. Um, and if, just as a disclaimer, so for the purposes of our workshop, this entire design has already been created for you. So you just have to like look through it and follow along with me for now. You don't have to edit anything just yet. So just try to play around with what's on the screen, but don't make any changes to it just yet. Just listen and follow along. Um, so yeah, okay. Within your screen, you have a bunch of uh, user interface elements. So the first element over here is a label. So label is basically like any text that you'd want to uh, show up on the screen. So um, this is labeled as label one. Uh, this is just so that we have some sort of identifier associated with the label so that we can uh, use it later on. And as you can see, the text that we have given this particular label is talk with chat GPT. And that's what's shown up on the screen um, in the mobile phone as well. The second component is a chat. Uh, components. So, uh, in this case, the chat is basically just a button. And uh, we have actually given this button a specific uh, background image. So this button in this particular case is actually the picture of a microphone. Uh, so the microphone button is what you're going to be clicking in order to interact with chat GPT when you test out your application. So as you can see, you can upload um, any sort of media. So in this case, we have uploaded like a mic.png file. And that's the image that we have given this particular button as well, which ultimately shows up on the screen. Uh, the next button is a restart button. And this is uh, the button that you can use in case you want to reset your entire conversation and start over with chat GPT. So rather than uh, continuing on an existing thread of a conversation, if you want to just uh, erase the entire thing and restart a brand new conversation with chat GPT, this is the button that you would use to do that. And as you can see, it's uh, given a specific text, new conversation, which indicates that you can have a new, new conversation with chat GPT. Now, apart from the obvious elements that are on the screen, which is the label and the two buttons that I just spoke about, we can also have these things called invisible components um, on our UI. So uh, these are uh, components that are not necessarily things that show up actively on the screen, but they still are very vital to the functionality of our application. So in this case, um, the idea is that you will have a conversation with chat GPT orally, like through this um, app interface. So in order to be able to do that, you will obviously need something called a speech recognizer, which will um, take the text from uh, the like words that you're speaking out and convert that to text and supply that to chat GPT. So it recognizes the speech or recognizes the words that you are saying out loud when interacting with the application. Um, the second component would be taking that text and then feeding that to chat GPT. And this is the chatbot component that uh, I think David previously spoke about in his introduction as well. Uh, this is the component that's the, like I guess, primary generative AI component that exists at the moment within App Inventor. And it's gonna take whatever text you give it. In this case, we are saying this text out loud. So it's gonna take that particular text and uh, send it to chat GPT so that it can generate an appropriate response to the text. So any question you're asking or any comment that you have left, chat GPT is now going to go and interpret it using this particular chatbot component. The third component is the text-to-speech component. So whenever chat GPT is done analyzing whatever text it's been given, it's going to generate an appropriate response. So it's going to say, answer a specific question that you asked. And you ultimately want that text to be translated back into speech so that the app can say those things out loud to it. So for example, if I ask the app, oh, what's the weather today? Then the app's gonna say, oh, the weather's like nice and sunny. 
for example. So we also want the app to converse back with us rather than just putting it in text so that it feels like we are having a real-time conversation with it. So this is the first part of the application uh, where we just designed this sort of step-by-step uh, -step process of like putting specific user interface elements on the screen. And this is the part that has already been given to you as part of the file that you uploaded. Now, ideally, when you're building an app from scratch, all these components you would be coding out. And we will share tutorials on how to go about doing that um, so that you can try it on your own time, like following this session. But for this session, we are actually going to have you um, code what the application does in the backend. So when I say backend, it basically means that you have all these user interface elements, and now you need to tell your app what sort of functionality these elements should perform, say when the button is clicked, or um, like when a specific element is being interacted with on the front end. Um, so yeah, in order to do that, uh, once you're done, like looking through this particular screen, on the top right-hand corner, uh, there is this button called blocks, which is what you're gonna click on. And this should take you to the screen, uh, ideally from the um, file that you uploaded. I'll pause here for a second. Are there any like pressing questions before I start going into this? I think the Q&A is empty now. I think they're able to follow through. So, and, and okay. I'll, I'll keep uh, answering any questions. Okay, yeah. But I'll also anyways, st uh, like stop periodically just to make sure that everyone's able to follow along. Uh, I wanna make sure I'm not going too quickly. Okay. Um. So yeah, once you click on the uh, blocks button on the top right-hand corner, uh, this is the screen that you should see ideally. Now, um, these components are what we call blocks and App Inventor uses this form of coding called block-based programming. So we use these programming blocks and we join them together to have our user interface elements perform some functions. And we'll walk you through what each of these blocks mean and what function is specifically performing with respect to um, a user interface element um, on the main app screen. So this is the first block that we're going to go over. This is a block that we typically call in computer science an event handler coding block. So what an event handler basically does is it tells the app what to do when a certain button is clicked, for example, on the screen. So in this case, this block is saying when chat dot click, which means when the chat button is clicked, what should the app do? That's what this block is going to convey. So in this case, our chat button is actually the microphone um, like uh, picture that we had uploaded on our screen. So we're going to convey to the application what to do when this particular mic button is clicked on the app. So in this case, what we would want to do is when the button is clicked, we want it to send some sort of signal or some sort of message to the speech recognizer component, which was the invisible component that we still had in our um, main app screen. So when this button is clicked, what we want the speech recognizer to do is we want it to get some text. Now, how is it going to get the text? Now, when you click the button, um, it's going to ask you to say whatever you want to convey to ChatGPT, right? So for example, if I wanted to ask, how is the weather today? the speech recognizer component is going to take that speech and convert it to written text, which all happens in the background. And you don't need to worry too much about how that happens. Just know that the speech recognizer component is able to convert that to text. And uh, this text is what's going to be processed now in the next step. So after the speech recognizer uh, receives this input uh, via voice, now it has to process this input. It converts it to text first, and then it sends it to chat GPT via the chatbot component. So as you can see, um, uh, in this particular block, um, it reads very like similar to uh, like, like conversation language. It just says that when speech recognizer um, after getting test, uh, text, which means once the speech recognizer receives input, what do you do next? That's what this particular block is addressing. So in this case, this block is going to 
send this message to chat gpt so it's going to use the dot converse function to send this particular question to chat gpt and get a response from it based on the text that you supplied but before we proceed uh, we are going to add some additional functionality to it um so just to keep in mind i think on the main file that we gave you some of these components or blocks were sort of disconnected so your job is to drag and drop it into uh, this particular block as shown um i'm going to pause there just for a second to make sure that you got a chance to do that because i think i didn't mention it earlier but make sure that you just drag and drop the component into the specific like it's like um a puzzle piece and just make sure that you put it into it and it will click it will give you a click sound when you are able to join it together cool i'm going to continue so as i was saying uh, we're going to add one feature before we continue like uh, going over these blocks so as a, a first step what we're going to do is we're going to uh look at the blocks panel on the left hand side of the screen and we're going to click on the chatbot component over there and when you click on that uh you will see this uh, sort of menu open up from which you can select any block that you want so keep in mind the blocks that are already on the screen were also selected in a very similar manner so from the left hand pane we uh like selected whichever component we wanted and we pulled out a specific block onto the screen so as a first step for this particular block you're going to click on chatbot and then you're going to pull specifically the component that says set chatbot system to and um as you can see when you sort of hover over that particular component it tells you exactly what that component is supposed to do as well so when you're first using app inventor you obviously won't be familiar with every single block that's available on this menu to pick from so what you can do is sort of look through the different options and if they don't intuitively make sense to you you can hover over it to see what particular functionality this component can perform and then pull the one that's most relevant to you accordingly so in this case this particular block is supposed to um take a given value um and it's supposed to set the tone of the conversation so for example when interacting with chat gpt sometimes you wanted to assume a specific role of a specific person so that you're able to have a better and more productive conversation with it and maybe a more fun conversation so for example in this case it can be something like oh you're a funny person i want to have a sort of funny conversation with you i want you to crack jokes for example so you would ideally want chat gpt to assume a more humorous role to be able to do so so in this case you're going to uh, click on that particular block which says chatbot.system2 set chatbot.system2 and you're going to drag that out once you drag that out you're actually going to go ahead and attach it just above the call um um block that we had over here so this particular block is now going to decide what role to assign to chat gpt before it processes the input that it got from the speech recognizer or from the microphone button on the screen so in this case uh, since we are building a college admissions app maybe we can have it be a college admissions counselor that can be the role that chat gpt assumes so in order to be able to do that you're going to once again click on the left pane of your screen and pull out the text component from it so these are the steps uh, to do so so you click on text on the left hand corner and then you'll pull the first block at the very top which is basically just an empty string and within the string you can specify what particular role you want chat gpt to assume so in this case once i click on that particular block i'm going to drag it and place it right over here next to the start, uh, chatbot dot system2 component i'm going to pause just for a second cool and as you can see uh, what you're going to do is type out a specific role you want chat gpt to assume so in this case uh, we're going to tell chat gpt to assume the role of a college admissions counselor so that it can give you advice on applying to colleges you are free to try out any role you want even with this tutorial this is just one example that i am giving which you can try out especially if you want chat gpt to help you out with college applications 
I'm going to pause for a second just so that you can think through this for a minute and think about what role you want ChatGPT to assume. Cool. So just to reiterate, so when this particular block is called, the following things happen. So it goes very sequentially. So the first thing is the speech recognizer. It will get the text from uh, the words that you just spoke out loud. And then uh, as a first step, it's going to set chargeability to a particular role that you have assigned it. And then following that, it's going to uh, send the text that it just uh, curated and it's going to send that to chat GPT to get a specific response from it. Now, let's look at the next block on the screen, which is the third one on the left. Um, so once chat GPT uh, generates a specific response, uh, this response is now going to be sent to the text to speech component that we had on our um, like invisible list of components on our screen so that it can respond to the app user via speech itself. So ideally, uh, once ChatGPT um, like so, so, sort of processes the output, you're going to hear the output uh, coming from your phone itself on the app. So uh, what will end up happening is you'll click on the button, you will ask ChatGPT a specific question, and then you will listen to the app for a response and make sure that your phone volume is turned up. Um, otherwise, you're not going to like get a specific response from it. And also be patient because it takes some time for ChatGPT to be able to process the output and for it to be sent to the text-to-speech components that the app is able to tell you what ChatGPT said. So make sure you give it some time. Uh, the final component that you have is the reset um, component. And this is the component that will sort of reset the conversation itself or make ChatGPT start a brand new conversation when the restart button is clicked. So when the new conversation button from your main user interface is clicked, this component is triggered just so that you reset the entire conversation and you basically start over. So yeah, once you do all these things, you'll be done building a very basic version of a chat GPT counselor, college counselor application. And as a next step, always with building any sort of application, you always want to test it out. You want to see if it works as expected before you give off your application to anyone. And this is exactly what we're going to do as part of our tutorial. Um, so yeah, as a next step, the first thing you're going to do is pull up your phone. Once you're done, like uh, joining all these blocks together, take your phone, make sure that the phone is connected to the same Wi-Fi network as the laptop that you're using. And you're going to go to either the Play Store or the App Store, depending on what phone you're using. And you're going to look up MIT App Inventor and download the application. Um, I'm going to like pause for a solid minute over here so that you have a chance to do so if you haven't done it already. Um, yeah, I'll like just set a timer for myself, but I'll give you one minute to make sure that you're able to find the app on the App Store and you're also able to download it. It might take a minute or so. Um, I'm going to wait. Yeah. Mean them, and meanwhile, if there are any questions, uh, let me know and I can help answer it. Make sure you're downloading the right application. Like it should say MIT App Inventor specifically. Yeah.
also this entire deck that i walked through that the link to that should have also i really already been shared with you guys and if not uh, we'll put that link in the chat um if uh, one of you can make sure that that's available to everyone that will be great just in case there were any steps that you missed or you didn't get to follow along just make sure that you look at the slide deck um i'm giving you one or two minutes to like help catch up so uh take your time and get that done Cool. Um, I think I'll go ahead. So um, once you download the app, as you can see the second screen over here, um, this is what should ideally show up when you open up the app on your phone. And you're going to hit the continue button. And on the next screen, uh, this is what you're going to see. Uh, you're going to see the screen on the extreme right on my screen. Um, and you'll be asked to either enter a specific code or scan a QR code and we'll tell you how to do that in a second. But uh, just make sure that you get to this particular screen on your phone. Regardless of what phone you're using, this is what you should ideally see. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so just to reiterate, before you go ahead, your phone should be on the same Wi-Fi as your computer. Now, what you're going to do is um, on your laptop, uh, you will look at the main like um, like screen that we have already been using and you're going to look at the top um, sort of, I guess, band and select the second option uh, called connect. Uh, so look at the connect drop down and select the first option, which is called AI companion. This is the option that you're going to be used to connect the app that you just built on your laptop to your phone so that you can test it out. So once you hit on AI companion, it's going to pull up a QR code um, or a six character code. Both of those should show up on your screen. And that's the QR code that you're either going to scan using your phone or you're going to enter that six letter um, code. And uh, once you do that, you should be able to have the app running on your phone. I'm going to give a minute again uh, to get that set up. Um, you can either scan the code um, or if somehow you uh, for some reason your camera is not working or if the QR code doesn't work, try to enter the code manually. Uh, it's just a six character code and um, you can get that by clicking on the AI companion option in the drop down. Cool. Um, I think I'll continue. Yes. So once you um pull up the code, it should pull up the app that we just built. The uh, you uh, the user interface should look identical to what you just built on your laptop. Now, like some of the elements might not look perfect. Like it's possible that your button looks very stretched or it's not proportionate to your screen size. This is something that you can adjust on your application later. But as a first step, you should see at least the three components that we saw on the main screen, which is the talk with chat GBT text, the main microphone button, and um, the new conversation button as well. And to test out your application, you're going to have a conversation with chat GBT. So when you click on the microphone button, it should um, ask you whether you want to start recording what you want to ask ChatGPT. So once you hit start recording, you can ask ChatGPT any question you want. So these are some sample questions that I have pulled up on the screen. So you can first ask ChatGPT like what role you're pay playing, like what role are you playing? So to that, ChatGPT should ideally say that, oh, I'm a college admissions counselor because that's the role you specifically assigned it. And it's going to tell you how it can help you out specifically. 
so once you like ask chargibity your question you're going to hit finish recording and then uh, you're going to wait for a response now this might take like a solid minute um because basically uh the steps that we went through through block based programming it's going to go through all those steps it's going to take uh the um like speech that you just like uh, said out loud convert that to text send that to the chatbot component and then send it back uh once chat gpt has generated a response so the entire process might take a minute so just make sure you give it a minute and also turn your phone volume high up and you should ideally hear chat gpt answer your question out out loud yeah uh these are some sample questions you can ask it um now i'm going to pause here for like i think at least 3 or 4 minutes because i want to make sure that you guys have this app working um yeah and uh, just make sure you're giving it enough time to generate a response maybe you can try out one or two questions to make sure that you have like thoroughly tested your application out so as a thumb rule whenever you build any application you should be testing it out and if there is any error you should also go back and ideally debug your application so that you're able to fix those errors uh this back and forth practice is super important as you start coding and as you take intro programming classes if you do these are things that are typically taught as well but you can practice these real time um using the app that you just built already which is great yeah um so yeah i'm going to pause here again for what at least a uh, 3 minutes or so and yeah um maybe you can put in the chat when you get something to work so that we know that it's working think of what questions you would ideally ask an admissions counselor right now like if you were given the choice like what would you want to ask like what college do i apply to what are the admissions requirements for that college like can you help me out with a specific college essay if you are in late high school for example or um if you're just confused on where to even start you can just ask how do i start applying like or how do i identify what i want to apply for you can ask anything you want and see what kind of response it gives and try to have a conversation with it like back and forth also the session is being recorded i think uh, there were a few questions regarding that it's being recorded so if there is any step that you missed you can definitely come back to it uh, so don't worry um yeah you can reference this video as you continue developing with app inventor
cool i'll i think i'll wait for one more minute and then uh, we'll move on to the last part of our session which will answer some of the questions that you asked in the chat um it's yeah it's a q and a so you can ask anything you want and we we'll be able to answer that orally Cool. Um, I think I'll uh, pause here. Um, if you guys have any other questions regarding what we just went through, like please uh, keep asking in the chat and we'll try to answer it. But uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. So this was a step-by-step -step version of like one tutorial that you can build, um, like one particular app that you can build uh, using MIT App Inventor. Like keep in mind, you can basically build any app that you want uh, with it. So there are a lot of tutorials that are already available out there on the main MIT App Inventor website. So if you just like um, on your browser, if you just try searching for MIT App Inventor, the very first thing that shows up should be the main MIT App Inventor website. And it has a lot of tutorials available there for you to sort of ramp up and learn how to build apps. Um, we'll obviously not have a chance to go over all those with you, but like, please feel free to ask any questions you might have. And we'll also put specific links in the chat. And uh, when we send a follow-up email, uh, maybe tomorrow, we'll also add those specific links in so that you can see what kind of apps you can build using MIT App Inventor. So yeah, um, I think as a discussion, what we're going to do now is spend maybe the next 10 to 15 minutes answering some of the questions that you had in the chat. So I think there were a lot of questions surrounding like, how do you apply to MIT? What is life like at MIT? Like what are the requirements? Or just maybe there were, there were questions regarding how to build applications or just general like career advice, college admissions advice. If you have any questions regarding like any of those aspects, now would be a very good time to ask those in the chat if you haven't already. And if you have asked those already, I'll ask our other panelists to um, maybe say those questions out loud and also try to answer it. And I can also try to answer any question that might be relevant to me. So I'll hand it off to you guys uh, uh, since you have been looking over the Q&A. If there were specific questions, please feel free to speak up and answer it right now. Um, well, I have seen uh, some questions in the chat regarding um, the application process to MIT. Uh, I think Gisela, you can you can give some tips about it. About the application process. Wow. Uh, good question. To be honest, I have forgotten quite a bit of it because it was, uh, I think, four years ago. But the main parts of like being prepared for MIT um, is just being able to take advantage of the opportunities that you have available to you. So if you're, say, in a rural area, you might not have like a robotics team, right? But that's totally fine. You might have another interest or club that's available near you that you can take advantage of. And that's really what MIT wants to see, right? Because sometimes students might say like, oh, my, this person, you know, went to this school that had these clubs and was a part of these um, organizations for a long time. And my school doesn't offer those same things. So the most important part is like, try to find things that you enjoy doing, um, and then making the most of the opportunities that you have. And you don't have to be the best at everything, contrary to what people might think. Like we are smart students, but you do not have to be the valedictorian. You do not have to have a perfect 32 GPA or a perfect 32 score or, or whatever GPA that everyone is worried about. Um, just be you. That's really what we're most like focused on because we don't want a whole student body full of everyone who's exactly the same, right? If everyone had the same background, had the same grades, then that would kind of not be the diversity or the inclusivity that we're trying to look for to try to make all of these technological advances. So don't worry about doing everything, doing what everyone else is doing, just 
do yourself. And that's all you need to do to get into MIT. And in general, um, a college application advice I will give is that also take uh, advantage of all the spaces that you have in your application. So if you're in your extracurriculars, you talk a lot like about your technology experience, your volunteering, your teaching experience. And there are some like um, extracurricular essays or uh, extra essays where you can develop a, a narrative of other aspects of your life, take advantage of it very wisely. Like check out, oh, maybe in this essay, I will talk about my technology experience in high school. In this other essay, I will talk about uh, my family journey and how, why, how, what I, I become um, the person I am right now and stuff like that. I, I, that's why how I craft my application. I try to take advantage of every space, not repeating things, for example. Uh, I think that's that's a nice strategy. Lots of other good questions. What is a good SAT score to be able to get into MIT? Um, so there is no hard and fast rule. Like MIT regularly rejects people who have perfect SAT scores. However, there is sort of like what we would call like a minimum of what we kind of hope that you guys have. And you can see that if you look on the admissions website and it shows you the statistics of the freshman students that are coming in. So I would say if you're looking for what kind of scores to have, look at the admissions page and the statistics so you kind of can gauge where you are at in comparison to like the other potential freshmen. And it changes every year too. So like sometimes it might be 32, it might be 33, it might be 31. So that's why I say definitely check the admissions website to have a better idea. Also, I see some questions in the chat about um, if you want to start learning programming, with which language will you should you start? I think there is no right wrong uh, answer here because it will depend of what you wanna do. If you wanna do more front end stuff, I think JavaScript could be a nice way. Uh, if you wanna go more to back end, you can start with Java, you can start with Python, or if you are new and you are you want to get familiarized with uh, programming logic, I always recommend App Inventor because that was the the first um, programming experience I ever had. And I think it was very friendly, like user friendly. And also it made me less scared of programming. A programming looks like, uh, it, it used to look like another word for me. Like, oh no, it looks very hard, very complex. But platforms like App Inventor make it uh, easy at the beginning. And then I started to learn other languages. I want to add on that. So, I, I see a lot of questions about textual programming and block coding, and what's the difference about that? Uh, a good analogy that I use is, um, I'm a big fan of Star Wars, and um, the Millennium Falcon is one of my favorite ships. Now, if I want to create a toy Millennium Falcon out of clay, I can, ver I can really make a very sophisticated Millennium Falcon ship, but it will take much more work and it's much difficult. You have to learn a lot of more basic stuff about clay, um, understanding how to craft things. But bl working with block coding is like creating the same ship with a Lego. So the final product is not gonna be as sophisticated as creating with the clay, but you can still have a very good vision of what you wanna have. And um, all, the thing is the basic logic still aligns. So if you're very com if you when you get very comfortable with block coding, then applying that and expanding that to textual based coding isn't going to be that difficult because in textual coding, the still the core lines still align in the sense of when you're building the Millennium Falcon, the core ideas of how the, what the Millennium Falcon looks like is all the same. It's just that you need to learn the the more sophisticated grammars for textual based codings. So I would say if you have no experience in coding, I think App Inventor or Scratch is a very good place to start learning and getting experience of coding. We 
Okay, so I see a question about the Zoom session saying um, it's tailored for students. It was asking if it's tailored for students who already have basic knowledge and coding um, or if it's not specifically for parents and then asking if we can give information if you don't meet the SAT requirements. Okay, so yeah, this session, I'm not sure, Perna, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think it's pretty open and accessible to anyone in terms of like yeah. background. You don't have to have CS to know any of yeah, this Yeah, no, um, not at all. I think uh, this session was actually meant to give you an introduction into what it is like to design an application and also to, to just get your feet wet with um, coding um and the blog based uh, coding environment that we showed you is a very good first introduction into how you can start programming like individually um this is meant for people like tailored to anyone like people who have absolutely no coding experience as well as those that might have like a little bit coding experience but want to develop on it uh, further and even if you're super proficient in it this is a great tool to practice your coding further so um, you can use MIT App Inventor as a platform to sort of develop your coding skills uh, further. And I think this is something that I mentioned in the very beginning, but App Inventor itself is a tool that's meant to teach everyone coding, not just students, but also parents, teachers, like literally anyone. Like if you are someone who's interested in learning how to program, App Inventor is a very good like first place to start, regardless of where you are at in your career, whether you're a student, whether you are working a full-time job, it doesn't matter. Like App Inventor is meant to give you that very basic scaffolded introduction into uh, programming and computer science. Yeah. And here's a question that I actually kind of really like. First of all, there is, what is the hardest thing to do as a programmer? And I, I, I really like that question. Um, as a there's a saying that when you, you only truly understand something when you can teach someone about that concept. There's a new version of that is that you truly only understand it when you can program it. And um, you will be very surprised of how sophisticated, detailed, and very um you have to go through a lot of iteration of bugging, uh debugging to to actually really create what you have in your head. And um, the hardest thing is uh, on the outside, it seems something like a very trivial stuff, but when you start programming it, it's not as trivial as you think it is. So that's the hardest thing as a programmer. There's another question of what's the difference of coding and programming? Well, that's, first of all, that's a textual uh, definition. So some people might say it's the same thing um, uh, personally, how I define it is coding is the act of coding, like uh, you're creating a textual code or in block coding, you're connecting blocks. That is coding. Programming is something that is not just about coding. It's also about designing something, um, designing an artifact, and then uh, going through a series of process of creating that artifact. Of course, coding is part of it. So that's how I see the difference of between those two things. Mm -hmm. David, do you want to answer the question about programming in other languages on App Inventor? I see. Um, so uh, I know some of our undergrads mentioned Apply. So what what Apply is um, is basically um, you uh, we're making a new platform where you can create an app with just your natural language description. So you can just say, "Make me an app that translates English to Spanish," and that app is automatically built on your phone uh, as a working app. Now, how it works on the back end is we are currently uh, creating a textual base that looks like Python uh, code that has a one-to-one -one mapping with our blocks in App Inventor. So what we do is uh, the generative AI automatically creates this Pythonic code that we are currently creating. And then that Pythonic code is converted into the blocks that you see on the screen. Now, we are also thinking about 
expanding this to teach students about textual based coding. So not only can you make App Inventor apps with the with moving blocks, but you can also uh, uh, create your app by uh, textually typing after learning learning some of the basic grammars of App Inventor code. You guys have a lot of really great questions. I know you already answered uh, this question, but there was one that says that, can a college accept you if you have some good IT skills but don't meet the SAT requirements? I know MIT is not test optional anymore, but there are other colleges that are still being test optional after that COVID and everything. Uh, I am from a college that was test optional. So when I apply, uh, I didn't took the SAT. And mostly my application was focused on the grades I had in high school, the extracurriculars I did, the words I had, and the essays, my background in general. So definitely the, you can enter to a college. Uh, what matters is that you generate a great strategy and you can balance your application. So for example, I always recommend that if you see that in high school you had some flaws in your grades, ISAT will be a nice option because then you can like demonstrate that even though you have some low grades, maybe in your in last years, you still have a great academic um, level. But if you feel like, oh, my grades in high school are very good and, and you feel like, oh, but I don't have too many extracurriculars, I haven't won, uh, won a lot of awards, maybe that's the, the place where you should dedicate the most time. So it's very strategic is to check that everything in your application, it's 100 percent like what you want to show, not like one part is 20 percent and the other ones are 80 percent. The idea is that is a balance. And the other question that they said was, what if I want to do nursing first, but still want to do something in the IT sector? And I really like that question too, because here in the States, uh, a lot of colleges and universities have liberal arts education. So when you enter to college, you can dedicate yourself to maybe um, health, like public health, and also have a computer science minor, computer science major, and stuff like that. So. Uh, once you enter college, don't feel limited. Like, oh, I enter with computer science, I should just attach to that. I know in MIT, you have a lot of like, the, they call the majors with numbers. So I know there is six, three, six, six, eight, six, seven. So, um, it's because they combine <laughs> like majors, computer science with economics, computer science with a uh, electrical engineer. So it's like, don't, don't let go your passions. You can actually study both majors or one major, one minor, two minors. And uh, just just keep that in mind. It's not like, oh, I always wanted to be a musician, but also a mathematician. I have to keep up on one dream. No, actually, college is for follow both dreams. Oh, another question. Uh, tips on writing compelling supplementals that showcase your key character aspects. What aspects of your personality should you highlight in your application? Um, that's a really good question. I think this kind of depends on you as a person, right? I can't really give like one stock advice for everybody because everyone's different and you can't all have the same compelling and memorable stories. But I would think back on specifically like any experiences that you have that you feel shaped who you are as a person. Um, so if that's something that you um, identify with, it could be like sports. Some people have been playing sports their entire life and they've gotten this huge, deep commitment and passion to it. Um, other people have done art or maybe people are more active in their community. So there's not really like a tip of like what you should do when you're writing it, but just think about like, if you were to give a short elevator pitch to someone, which is like a short explanation of who you are as a person, what would be the thing that um, you'd want them to walk away from that conversation remembering about you? And that's something that I use when I write my own supplementals. And it kind of helps me focus on the most important parts. Oh, in terms of tips on the part about your app personality, I would highlight uh, 
your perseverance or your resilience, because specifically at MIT, you will fail at some point. You're going to either fail an exam, fail a class, fail something, but it will happen probably in freshman year, but it's going to happen. And usually for a lot of students, when they get to that first failure, they kind of just fall apart and they just don't know what to do. And it kind of spirals into a negative cycle. So I would definitely hone on your ability to persevere despite roadblocks, obstacles, and failures and how to use that to sort of fail better. So it's okay if you keep failing, but try to make it so that you're failing up instead of like stuck in one spot. Ooh, okay. So any weight for sports and applications? Um, MIT does not recruit for sports. It's purely merit-based. So it's really up to you if you want to include things about sports. I would probably include that if you have a leadership position. But if it's just something where it's like you went once a week and you kind of did it so you can have something written on your resume, I probably would focus mostly on other things besides that. So just keep that in mind that like you could be great at sports, you could get all of these awards, but MIT really cares about if you can handle the academic rigor first, and then like you can explore those other parts of like sports and, you know, extracurriculars. Lots of other good questions. Oh my gosh, I cannot keep up with all of these. So um, I don't know, Perna, if you want me to answer all of these, because they're just like continuously coming in. I know we do have well, a set I, time. I think maybe I can, yeah, I can maybe point out one or two more questions that yes. you can answer. And uh, let's see. I think one question is like regarding community service and how that, how important that is for like, I guess, MIT uh, or like any college for that matter when ap applying and I think um, I, I guess I can start off by answering yes I mean it is important if that's something that you like closely resonate with and uh, the tools that you build or any activities that you do if you want to specifically help other people then community service or um, any sort of engagement with nonprofit organizations is an excellent way to give back to the community so really like taking the skills that you are acquiring through your coursework or through your classes and applying that um, to serve others like that's a very rewarding way to give back to the community and also to uh, exercise and like really use your skills um, and that's something that I think for me I enjoy doing that in high school a lot um, and that certainly did help like heavily I would say uh, for my college applications as well but that's something I continue doing during undergrad as well and not necessarily for the purpose of like applying to grad school or for like an overarching goal I think I just based on the research that I do I really enjoy like sort of um, outreach work working with non-profits and giving back to the community so that's something that I personally enjoy doing on a daily basis so I try to do as many of these events as I uh, can given my schedule um so yeah and yes it does um, like I guess uh contribute very positively to a college application as well so if you have engaged in such activities in the past definitely do include it on your college applications like this is something that colleges do consider pretty seriously yeah uh let's see And there's a question on tips for interviewing. Like, did you guys have to interview for MIT for undergrad? I, I don't know. Like, I wasn't at MIT for my undergrad, so. I'll... So it is not required, but it is encouraged to interview for MIT. Uh, I did in interview. Actually, it was a funny story. My AP computer science teacher, her husband was my interviewer. So it was like a small world. I did not realize that he had gone to MIT before. Um, so we kind of already had a rapport there just from the fact that like, he's my teacher's husband. Um, and the interview was not like intense where you think like, oh, I'm going to say the wrong thing. And they're going to immediately just like strike me off the list. No, it's a very casual conversational interview. They're not going to be looking at your resume and be like, oh, I noticed you did this. Tell me more about that and grill you on everything. No, they really just want to see if you're able to explain your experiences in a way that shows that you're going to continue that at MIT and that you're not simply 
just applying there just for the name or for other reasons. They want to know like your actual true passions and motivations behind it. Um, there's a question on grad school applications. So I can talk about that uh, for a second. Um, so the GRE, um, like it's first of all, not mandatory for all schools. Um, it also depends on what program you're applying for. So I applied for a PhD program directly straight out of undergrad. And for PhD programs, more often than not, the GRE is not mandatory. It really depends on the schools that you apply to. But for me, I think I was in a position where I needed the GRE for only one of the schools that I applied to for uh, grad school. But for a master's program, it's uh, pretty typical for them to uh, have GRE be like a required part of your application. So uh, it does matter in the sense that your GRE score is like used more often than not as like this initial filter because they receive a lot of applications, like a lot of applications, right? So in order to filter applicants out in the initial stage, the GRE might be used as a, a critical factor. So it's obviously important if you do decide to submit it, especially if it's optional and not required, make sure you're submitting it only if it like contributes positively to your application. That being said, uh, the GRE is not the only thing that sort of decides whether you get into a school or not. With grad school applications, I think your essays, your letters of recommendation from people you have worked with in your undergrad, your grades in your undergrad, those things sort of matter more or equally if anything like the GRE is just one of the many things that they consider it's a very like holistic view of your application so um you definitely want to make sure you're paying attention to the other aspects of your application as well it's not the end of the day if you ha don't have the best GRE score the other aspects of your application can definitely like make up for it I can definitely say that about like grad school um, that being said, if you do have a good score, that can also be sort of a deciding factor if it comes down to two applicants at the end of the day and they have just one spot left. So having a good score is always an advantage, uh, but it's again, it's not um, a make or break situation. So just keep that in mind when you uh, like don't get too worked up if you don't have the best GRE score. Uh, make sure that you have other things like make sure you're doing research in your undergrad, like you maybe are teaching an undergrad. These things count a lot more like for grad school applications. I can say that and make sure you're building very good relations with the professors that you work with or just the mentors you work with or if you do an internship make sure you have a good relationship with the manager who is supervising you directly all these are people who can like attest to your skills and write you a really good letter of recommendation rather than a very generic one when you apply for grad school like those things end up really counting for a lot more uh like I think when applying to grad school, it's most important that in your undergrad, you have really taken initiative and you have gone out of your way to like sort of engage in very specific activities that will tailor to your research area and it will also contribute positively to your application. But um, yeah, just make sure that you're able to package things well. A lot of like application writing in general, whether that's undergrad or grad school is you've obviously engaged in a lot of activities regardless of uh, whether you're in high school or an undergrad, but it's how you're able to sort of present that well and you're able to package it well into your essay and other aspects of your application, whether that's your resume or a portfolio if you decide to make one. So it's how you present your work that ends up mattering in some scenarios a lot more. So yeah, uh, there are a lot of tips available out there regarding that. And uh, you're also welcome to like email us to sort of get a little bit more feedback. But um, yeah. And don't get intimidated by like the fact that, oh, oh, I have to apply to like so many colleges. You can definitely do it. It, yeah. Um, I think just take it like step by step and you'll definitely get there. Yeah. Oh, I do want to mention that if you guys are applying to multiple colleges, um, I would, I know a lot of people probably have similar questions between the colleges. So I would research the questions because there's a lot of overlap and it'll be easier for you guys to just write one essay that you just tweak depending on like which college it's for. Like this one's asking like, oh, what is, uh, describe a time where you overcome a challenge. Pretty much every college asks that question. They might phrase it slightly differently. So I would read all of them and make sure that you have like a generic stock essay for different types of essay questions. That way you can just tweak it and go back to it instead of having to write completely new essays for every single one. I think I ended up having about eight stock essays when I was applying 
um, just because some colleges had four questions, some had three. Um, so try to have like eight to 10 question types ready to go. It'll speed up the process a lot. Um, cool. I think I'm going to stop here because I think we're nearing like closing time. But if you guys have any other questions, like we'll also be sending out um, like a survey uh, either tomorrow or day after. Um, like it's like a feedback form. And on that, if you have maybe any specific questions, you can um, like jot that down and we'll convey it to you in some shape or form uh, following that. Um, so yeah, please feel free to ask any other questions you might have. But I think I'll... Um, hand it over to uh joe now yeah oh my god guys that was awesome thank you for so many questions it says here that you answered 75 of them over text and more of them certainly were answered you know vocally we've had all sorts of stuff come in what an awesome event so thank you so much um for taking the time today this was Really an incredible event, and and I can't thank everybody at App Inventor enough for making this possible. Uh, for those who are still here 90 minutes later, um, I hope you guys had a great time. We will be posting the recording on our on our YouTube channel, and um, the App Inventor folks may be posting this places as well. Um, look out for a follow-up email from us. Make sure you get those apps in for this year's App Challenge. Two weeks to go. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks again to everybody who made this possible. Uh, looking forward to seeing all your apps come in before the deadline. Have a great night, everybody.